am curious if you could just tell us where you think things will go. Uh, and I heard some questions, but I didn't hear some answers. Uh, dur uh, through the course of the 2024 elections, are we going to be okay? And if so, um, what do we need to do? So the question I understand is, 2024, are we going to be okay? Uh, go ahead. I, actually, it's funny. I, I did two different workshops this morning. And so I was over with Daniel Bennett and then I came over to Elizabeth Newman's and we had a very similar question going at each time, right? So uh, I was over there with Daniel Bennett and Dan, Dan was like, yeah, I'm pretty, pretty optimistic. Our institutions, I think we'll hold together. And then I walk over here and I walk into Elizabeth Newman's talk and she's like, uh, yeah, this could be the end of our democracy. And <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else want to take the 2024? Yeah. Well, I would just like to clarify. <laughs> um, I think it's going to be a really hard year. I think there will be violence. I don't think we're looking at another January 6th. I think law enforcement has uh, woken up to the problem and would be much um, more prepared so that it would not get to uh, that kind of point. That said, we still have groups that are plotting. They've gotten more sophisticated in their communications, so they're um, easier to, or harder for us to detect. Um, and they may try to instigate something. Um, we have individuals who think that if things don't go their way, that they may, it's incumbent upon them to take action. So when you combine those two things, I think it's in, very likely we'll see violence of some sort. Um, the special sauce, if you will, is when you have a charismatic personality that also calls for that violence. And right now we have somebody in the election that has a histor history of doing that. So um, all of those things, uh, to me, we're in for some difficult times, but that doesn't mean that we, that the system will fail or that we won't be here in 2025 talking about the fracturing of our church. It's just, it's something we have to walk through. At least we are way more awake to the problem now uh, than we were in 2020. And so we can have the conversations with people now about a proper response to fear, about um, how we can love one another, people, love one another that are different than us. Um, and all of those things in small ways over time will make a difference. But I do think we have a journey in front of us. So I uh, refrain from making any concrete predictions about what will happen. But I think the exercise is a helpful one for us to think about in terms of our own spiritual formation. And I would distinguish, there's two ways you can think about the future um, and your desire for a prediction. Like, I think that's the real question. What is behind our desire for a prediction more than what is the prediction itself? Because I think if we dive and excavate our desire, it's we're looking for some certainty. We're looking for certainty in a highly uncertain uh, time and, and context. And that's the real spiritual question is, what is the Christian uh, faithful posture in a moment of great uncertainty. And I would argue that the answer is not, give me a prediction of what will happen. That, that, that that's a false, that's, that's gonna lead you down a path that it does not actually lead to spiritual health. And so that's the diagnostic. The diagnostic question is not what will happen, it is why do I need to know so much what will happen? Um, and, and what do I think that that knowledge is somehow supposed to save me? Uh, and if that's the case, we're looking to the wrong savior. Any other questions? So, first of all, thanks for the conference. It's a great conference. I think uh, it's needed all across our country. So, I understand the whole um, need to help people in our churches and in our communities with the with the whole hope and humility uh, continuum. I think that that today was the takeaway for me. It was a great. A great illustration um, to help us with that uh, what question, um, and I fully support it. Fully, fully think. However, 
there's a part of me that still believes, uh, still trying to figure out what is the role of the church when it comes to the message uh, to our congregation on the sanctity of marriage and life, um, and even the sanctity of our country. Uh, how does the church, the senior pastors, help with uh, our congregation making decisions, which ultimately takes a step into that political space? Um, so, he, so here's the challenge, I think, for the church, um, and that we live in a democracy. Um, the Gospels were not written in a democracy, but we live in one today. Um, as, uh, as pastors and as churches, we should want our congregants, we should, Christians should be good citizens of our democracy. So that means participating, right, in our democracy. But, but the problem is the more people participate, the less they look like Jesus. So it, that presents a real challenge because getting really involved in politics, we've seen this so many times, it just makes people worse, right? Um, so uh, so I, I think that's the real challenge in that we, we want to, um, and, and something that we really haven't done well at all because we, we tend to... Um, just avoid it, avoid talking about politics because it can be so divisive and because it can make us so nasty and, and tear our churches apart and that kind of thing. Um, and so it's the not talking about it that's le left the gap. I think that's been filled by some other voices that uh, have not been positive. Um, so uh, th yeah, t to me, that's, the, that's the really the big challenge. I mean, you, you brought up some policy areas, but I, I think to me, that's the overarching thing that we need to be thinking about. So I, th I think this is critical for us on issues like sanctity of marriage, is to understand what is the church's role in that? What is the primary role of the church in that? I would argue the biblical vision of the primary role of the church is to form our own people. That is our job, is to form our people in the values that are distinctive to Scripture. So on all matters, race, the environment, uh, crime rate, all that, and marriage. Our job is to form our people. This would be my argument for what has happened for decades, centuries, is that increasingly, and this is always, historically, this is always the temptation of a church that has a culturally dominant position, which is what the American church has had, especially the American evangelical church has. It is, we start letting the culture and the state do the job for us, right? Rather than us forming our people, we start sort of coasting on the broader culture and our command and dominance and influence over the broader culture and, and, and political power to actually do the work that we're supposed to do in forming the people. And I, I, this is my take, is a lot of the anxiety, and it is anxiety, that conservative Christians feel on issues like marriage, gender, and sexuality, which is legitimate, I understand it, I feel it myself, right? About you know, what my kids are, the views that they are embracing, uh, I have all sorts of anxieties uh, about that. It's, it's legitimate. But the answer is not, so therefore I need to get somehow political power to form my kids or my grandkids. Right? That is not the role of the church. It's our job to form it. It's not, it's, it's so, so to seize political power to somehow think that is going to actually form our, it's, that's a dead end. It's not, it, that is not, that has never actually led to great results in the formation of Christian people, and it's, it's not where formation is happening now. And it, it's an evasion of responsibility to get so preoccupied with seizing political power to form our people somehow that we're actually not actually forming our own people, right? So... Uh, I absolutely think it's important to do, but, but let's do it to our evil. And that's really, that is, that is actually the deep underlying uh, weakness and flaw in the American Christian church that's actually even deeper than politics and political polarization. Because you go through all of these different issues, again, whether it's around COVID, race, politics, or that, those, these ultimately are failures of formation. That, that people are taking, are being formed by secular voices, 
whether on the left or on the right on these views, than by the gospel, than by the, the scripture, than by the full council, you know, Elizabeth, the full council of the church. And so that we've, got a re, we've got a deeper problem, actually. I hate to say this, you people are like, politics is hard enough, but honestly, politics, even the political polarization is a symptom. It's a symptom of a deeper problem of a failure formation, and that we can no longer, and we should never have, but we, we certainly in this age can no longer expect the culture to do that work for us. Perhaps in some of your regions, if you, you think you can get by longer with that, but th it is not going to last. And even that culturally reinforced, it does not, it does not run deep. It does not actually form people for life. Because once they get out, and we're in a hyper-mobile society, once our kids move and leave our little cultural bubble, they're exposed to other forces, and if they have not been actually formed, and they've just been coasting on a cultural atmosphere around them, it will evaporate. It, it, it just, it, you, you see it all the time with the, this generation. So that's my answer. Amen. <laughs> I mean, come on, you guys. He was preaching there. That was, that was good. Um, yeah, I, the only thing I would add is um, it is okay for those of us who grew up in the Christian culture and experienced some of its blessings to be aggrieved, to be sad that it's changing. And it's, it's okay to grieve that. We also need to have clear eyes in our grief just, hey, it's normal. When somebody passes, we tend to focus on the good things. There were bad things about that culture. And the Lord is allowing this to happen because it needed to die. I think we're being sifted because of our many failures. So, Yes, grieve, and I think um, my parents' generation, so boomers in particular, feel it more intensely than perhaps younger generations, and I, we can empathize with that for those of us that are younger who are like, this, you know, why are you guys so wrapped around the axle about this? We, let's have empathy. For some in that generation, it, worked, it was a system that worked well, but for a whole lot of other people, it didn't work well. And we need, we need to let it die. And the sooner we can get to the other side and be like, okay, that's gone, we can, we can get to what Curtis is getting here, which is, you know, it, it actually was hindering our growth. It was preventing us from fully forming disciples. And so let's get back to our job, which is to go and make disciples. And it turns out we need to be doing it here. Thank you. What other questions? Follow-up question to that. Um, so what does uh, discipleship look like in a culture where we're being formed by so many secular voices? Uh, I think that one of the things that I've been hearing is, like, obviously we should love each other well. That's absolutely a foundational discipleship thing, and, and especially when we have differences. But when it comes to some of the, the principles and even policies that is the, the what of politics, you know, there, there are some things the Bible does speak to that. And, and how do we, maybe after building those foundations of loving each other better, how do we, how do we bring that up in a, in a positive sense where, you know, rather than pulling away and just letting culture speak into that? Does that But my short answer, and then I want to hear from Curtis, is that we need to be less focused on winning and just focus on being obedient. Ooh, yeah, and I'll follow up. What does winning mean as a pastor? No, no, seriously. It's a good question, right? What does it mean for us as a pastor to feel like we're winning? Let's be honest here. We're among colleagues and peers. The dominant answer is, grow a big church, right? Big, get a new building, get, get, your, get a big staff. We, we would be foolish to not admit that's, that definition is somewhere circulating in our head when we say, what does it mean to win, right? 
this is easier for me to say because I'm not a pastor anymore. But I think that is losing. I think that is actually a recipe that is in this particular cultural moment. It is not for sure losing. It is, let me, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm stating too strongly. It is making you more vulnerable to lose. Because the reason is because that model was birthed in side by side with the ascent of the consumer era. Consumerism is actually the bigger God than even politics. Consumerism shapes our people and forms our people even more than any particular party does, right? And that model, why it succeeded for so long is it, it went hand in hand with a consumer mindset, right? You show up on church, you get, you get a big church so you can get big programming, a big array of offerings, and, it, and you then, in a big gathering, the, the way the economics work, you have a small group of pastors that are paid, large base of giving units, consumers, right? And so that's, that's the model of church growth. That's, that's been our model, right? Not saying there hasn't been good fruit of that. I'm not saying there's some value in that. And, and let's face it, we're all, all inherited that model, right? One, it's in the room. This is, this, is, this is describing a lot of the churches that are in here. So I'm not saying it's inherently bad or we need to chuck it, but we need to examine it very seriously, because it has, I would say, this is, again, easy as an ex-pastor to say, I'm, I'm just going to say, I think it has not done a good job of forming our people. Because they're consumers. They don't own the process of spiritual formation. It's thin, right? It's a very thin formation. It, it puts them on Sunday morning in a passive consumer mindset. And, and we have to, we're constantly having to preach against it, teach it against it, but our model reinforces it, Right? Um, it's, we're fighting against our own model. Even when we say we want deeper formation, the basic business model and the basic structure puts, it just puts people in a consumer mindset and puts, honestly, us in a, it tempts us to be in a consumer provision uh, model, attractional, how do we meet their needs, how do we, right? And that makes it very hard then to form people deeply against the countercurrents of culture in, in any direction, including on things like marriage, frankly. Right, um, and so I, I think there needs to be a, a deep re-examination among us about how do we transition from a consumer uh, model, based model, to a formational model, where where our people own and participate in their own spiritual formation, and we are are stewards of that formation, not not deliverers of program, not not providers. We're not vendors. We're not spiritual vendors, right? Um, and so I don't know. That is, the, that is the big question for us in the next hundred years as a church. And, and I agree with Elizabeth. I think all of the fractures and the crises are both a judgment on the old model, a revelation of its weakness, and an opportunity for us to reinvent, right? For those of us who are, can be in that place to reinvent brand new ones, for those of us who have the old model and are figuring out how do we, how do we steward it well to reinvent from within, both those kinds need to happen. I'm not saying you chuck all of, the, all of what we've inherited out. There needs to be reinvention and innovation from within the existing structure of a big, large, programmatically driven church. We can't get rid of that overnight, but it needs to be rethought, reworked, and innovation birthed from within that. And the idea is a partnership between those who are birthing brand new models with those who have the structure and the resources of the old model, and you marry those two in a partnership of, of mutual, you know, because there's a lot of people that who are, want to blow everything up. We're like, you know, you have something to like learn from people who have been building these ministries for a long time as well. So I'm not just saying there's nothing to offer, but, but we all need to be in a partnership saying this, this is the time for reinvention. Right over here. Thank you for this, by the way. I know it's a lot to stand in front of people and field questions, so thank you. Um, so very tangibly, like our church is about three miles from where President Trump does his rallies. Um, so when you hear, when, when in our context we hear, faithfulness to the gospel, faithfulness, stepping away from the political party, what they tangibly hear is vote for Biden. If you say the same thing in a, a different demographic, what they hear is t faithfulness to the gospel, go vote for Trump. Or they hear, don't focus on winning, focus on faithfulness. Okay, vote third party. Um, abdicate your vote and don't vote at all. Um, so I think 
I, I'm just wondering if you could kind of clarify in some way how this just gets kind of muddled in the mind where it's like, you're not saying one thing like, hey, you should go vote for that person, but you're, you're, you're advocating for principle and, and, and just wondering how, how do we tangibly do that for people who hear, oh, well, they must be this because they're telling me not to be faithful to my own demographic, if that makes sense. Um, I, I think a lot of this has to do with the the political version of what I just talked about of a of a mis just like we have misdefined church being a disciple and being a member of a church and reduced it down to attendance to a program. We have also misdefined and reduced politics to what vote you cast every four years in a presidential election. Does that make sense? It's a, it's a thin definition and a wrong definition because politics is so much more expansive than just what vote you cast every four years on an issue, frankly, that you have very little like, influence on, right? Your vote is a, a, a tiny drop and in some states completely irrelevant actually to the outcome, increasingly so, right? Because of where, where, the way the polarization has happened, right? I think it is incumbent on a church, if you want to show people a different way of defining politics than a binary, who did you vote for? That is where creativity needs to come, play, come up. It is the church's um, opportunity to develop ways of political engagement that are not reduced to a four, what will you vote for every four years, which is such a thin and insufficient. What, what are your schools like? You know, is there sufficient funding for your schools? Uh, are, 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 are women who might be, is there, is there sufficient uh, safety net to care for women such that they can choose life rather than abortion because of their economic pressures? Are, is there a safety net? Those, these are all political issues, right? Are, is it for, for immigrants, right? Yes, we're also focused on like the border. That's like a, that's like a, that one thin slice of the issue of immigration. We are getting tons and tons of immigrants regardless. And part of the reason why the border is so uh, at a period of, of strain is because actually the absorption upstream of, of, of taking in migrants is, is incoherent and poorly developed in our country, right? So, and even at the local level, like there's, there, there's just the pathway to citizenship, the pathway to integration into society. It's really haphazard, ad hoc, and poorly funded, frankly, right? So on all of these issues, there are oppor creative opportunities for the church to say, let's do this, which is not a vote. It's not a, it's not a this or that way, but let's, just, let's work on this issue that's close to home, that's in our neighborhood or in our city and so forth, and let's work on that. Let's solve that problem for our neighbors, for our, our, our community. Um, and so we've, we've got to create signs, right? So, you know, it's interesting. One of the um, key biblical stories, uh, so this is in the book. The, the, I have a book coming out in the after, that's the companion volume. So it's not in the course, but it's in the book that's coming in April. But one of the great passages when Jesus is tested by a combination of the Herodians and the Sadducees, right? And these are two political enemies. These are two political parties. And they conspire to, it says, to test Jesus. And there's like, they're basically saying, we want to, and they basically say, declare a side. Are you pro-Roman or anti-Roman? They want, and, you know, show your cards, right? It's kind of like, who are you going to vote for, Biden or Trump? It's kind of, it's like, we, we need to declare. And Jesus does this really interesting parable. He says, hey, this is the parable, like, do you see this, the color of the sky? When, do you know when it's red, there's a storm coming? And he's basically saying, I'm going long-winded into it, Jesus, I'm sorry here, I, I'm realizing I'm, I'm neck deep now. Um, but basically, what Jesus is doing is say, hey, rather than testing me, I want you to read the signs of the time, right? Like, create a sign. And so this, he's basically trying to shift Christians from responding to political pressures, from tests. Who you vote for? Which, are you on, which side are you on? To, like, signs. Be sign, create signs that point to the kingdom. And rather, so that's what we should be preoccupied as a church. How can we create living signs in, that, that are in our sphere of action, in our neighborhood, in our city, whatever, that signs that point to the kingdom? That will be a political act. It won't be a partisan act, left or right, but it will be a political act. We're saying the good is this way, 
right? So let's just get more creative. Just to reduce this down to that simple vote is so unproductive and thin. Uh, let's together think, how do we create living signs that point to the kingdom that will invariably show a picture of what Christian politics looks like that's not partisan? I'm just curious, if, can I just see a show of hands? Have you ever heard somebody tell you or tell somebody else, if you don't vote for a particular candidate, then you can't be a Christian? <laughs> That's almost unanimous. Think about how crazy that is. Um, so, yeah, so this gets back to what I was saying earlier, like, you should vote, you know. You're a citizen. That's good citizenship. Yes, you should vote. And also what Cutter said, your vote's not going to make a difference, all right? So, like, that, that's, that's like the one act. So, we're focused on this one act of voting when instead of, like, you know, we have in the Bible the fruits of the Spirit, you know, but we're going to compare somebody to who they voted for. It's just like, it's, uh, you know, we've, we've really gone off the deep end if people are, are saying that in churches. I guess I would just add the, to, to the, two groups you were describing, if, the, if they are really um, intensely associated with their belief, their party, um, you're probably not going to talk them out of that. Um, so your goal is uh, perhaps to um, insert doubt, offer a third way, but um, change is long term. You're not going to change too many minds this year. Um, but you can, over time, take a small group of people that are open to it through the after party or take um, a group and get them more engaged in something locally. I, I truly believe the answer to our national politic problem is to get people to re-engage with their local communities where their vote actually does matter. And those politicians actually have way more impact on your day-to-day -day life um, like, and by the way, life and death decisions sometimes because they're responsible for responding in, uh, to emergencies. And I can't tell you how many times in my 25 years of Homeland Security where we've just been so utterly befuddled at the uh, lack of competence at the local level to be able to respond. But that's on us. We elected them. So it would be, there's, there's so much to be done. Our communities are in desperate need of support. Um, I, in my community of Denver, we're receiving a lot of immigrants, um, uh, asylum, uh, asylum um, people who are waiting for their notice to appear, which might take eight years for them to do. Um, disclosure, I'm the board chair of the National Immigration Forum. I have a lot of opinions about what we need to be doing to fix immigration, but my first heart is for people showing up in the middle of Denver who are from Venezuela, and it's minus 20, and we weren't told that they were coming, so nobody was waiting for them, and there are kids. There are people with desperate need in our local community, and not only can we help them as a church, but our votes matter, like having the right mayor in place so that he competently can manage a, a crisis situation, that mattered. People are probably alive today that wouldn't have been if we had an incompetent mayor. And I'm not making a political statement that I support that mayor. It's just that he handled the crisis well. So to the extent that you have opportunities to connect people with local politics or local um, policy matters, I do think that starts to change people's understanding of politics, and that would be actually really healthy for us um, to be seen as, yeah, a, a church that's involved in our local community as opposed to a church that's advocating for national policy. Well, can we just say thank you to this panel? Um, thank you all. Okay.